So I'm not sure how many of you have seen the Lego movie, which came out in 2014, although I suspect many have. Yes, okay, already. In the movie, you might remember Will Ferrell played a villainous CEO character named President and Lord Business, who tried to suppress creativity by supergluing all Lego pieces together. Our guest tonight could not be more different from President and Lord Business. Thankfully, a, a PhD economist, Jürgen Wagnustrup started his career as an academic researcher and educator, and perhaps as a sign of things to come, was a kindergarten teacher before becoming a McKinsey consultant. Jürgen's background and understanding of the neuroscience and power of playful learning positioned him well to become the CEO of Lego Brand Group at 34 years old, just saying the first non-family member to lead the closely held Danish toy maker now owned by the grandson of its founder. The young CEO had his challenges in 2004. Lego Brand Group was losing almost a million dollars a day. The company was a victim of overexpansion and brand dilution, and Jurgen was tasked with bringing the beloved brand out of the red and from the brink of collapse. His plan included initially scaling back the company, focusing on the core, and then rebuilding it to become the world's largest toy company with revenue of about $7 billion. And it all goes back to Jurgen's understanding that Lego customers, as well as employees, have a desire to create. Just like when customers create a Lego build, he knows Lego team members will drive innovation and better solutions if they're free to create. He's famous for thanking his employees at year end uh, for doing all of the things he did not ask them to do, and in, maybe more importantly, not always doing what he did ask. We'll come back to that. Now, for those of you who haven't seen the Lego movie, you will be happy to know, spoiler alert, that the animated president and Lord Business finally sees the error of his ways, allows his son to play and create with his collection of unglued Legos. I am thrilled to welcome the executive chair of the Lego Brand Group, my fellow Starbucks board member, and a champion for creative play at any age, all the way from Buller, Denmark, Jürgen Vignutrup. I mentioned at the beginning, for those of you who are listening, that there's a little bag of Legos at your table that I'm hoping you still have and haven't opened, and Jürgen's going to explain why we want you to take a look at those now. That's great. Yes, I would like to just uh, start by, with a few things. First of all, I'll say I'm extremely pleased to be here. Uh, I'm usually in the US 10 to 12 times a year. This is my second visit in a month, and before that it had been maybe 18 months or so before, uh, since, since last. So it's really great to be here. And um, just, a few, just a few words that I'm feeling quite strongly about, which is I think all great businesses are really fixated on one idea. And often, great businesses are founded on a revolutionary idea that's very unconventional in how it deals with an important issue. That issue that we are concerned about is learning and how children can realize their, few, their, their whole human potential. We know that learning systems don't really work very well. We know how important it is. There was, for instance, a study in Dundee, New Zealand, done as a longitudinal study that found that children that developed their executive skills, the prefrontal cortex, ended up happier, more wholesome, not getting divorced, making more money also, completing education. So we can see a link from what happens in the early childhood throughout the rest of life. We also know children need to tackle intractable problems of creating equity, solving climate change, or living in a world that's dominated by artificial intelligence where those things that are very difficult for computers but very easy for human beings, such as creativity, using your common sense, is becoming much more critical because all the things that are difficult for human beings will be taken over by computers recognizing patterns and computational skills. Einstein said, it's a miracle if curiosity survives formal education. <laughs> and we believe that's unfortunately still true, and even in the most developed countries in the world, 20% of students who leave primary school do not have the basic skills required to succeed in life. Our reason for existing, and I think all businesses need a strong answer to why do you exist, we exist, as we say, to inspire and develop the builders of tomorrow so they can become creative problem solvers. 
we went into trouble, as I'm sure we'll talk about, because we lost track of what we're all about and thought it was something completely different. And when things went wrong, it was all due to the US dollar or some unsporty competitor. And we did not track the right things. And we really got lost. And the best way I can explain that is really looking at the Lego bricks. Uh, and you know, here's my helicopter. And the quality of this helicopter is that I think it looks like a helicopter. And I can throw it around and it will not fall apart. And I have my little mini-me sitting here on top. And yet, you only have to be two years old to actually be able to take it apart and put it together. And it's not glued. And that's a unique material. There is no material like this. And it turns out you can build anything you can possibly imagine. If you go to the YouTube brand channel for Lego, you'll find 10 billion videos, which is twice as many as the second biggest brand on YouTube channel. Because people love to create. There's like an inner urge to be creative. But enough about that. Um, we know from neuroscience that the human brain can basically capture 20 megabytes in its random memory, which means it's like 10 quick photos on your iPhone, which means you've already forgotten what I began to say a few minutes ago. <laughs> so the only way you'll really understand what I'm talking about is if you'll be so kind to take the little bag that each of you have in front of you on your table, and then I'd like to ask you to open the bag, and now I'm going to give you 45 seconds to build a duck. You are started now. <laughs> I'm, just grab, I'm just going to grab something I forgot. Yeah. And you're 10 seconds down. And we're talking about a dock that we might find in a lake just outside the hotel. And you have about 20 seconds left. <laughs> so about five seconds left to complete your dock. Once you're done, can you raise your hand and hold your dock? Show everybody at the table your duck. We should be done by now. Can I see your ducks? Okay. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So have a look at your docks. And um, you'll, probably be, uh, you'll probably be noticing a couple of things. One is you look at your neighbor's dock and you kind of go, why did you build it that way? I did that's <laughs> not what I thought. And it turns out that while you're doing this 45 sec second um, exercise, you are activating about 25 different centers in your brain. Spatial recognition, executive function, memory, imagination, modeling skills. Um, but of course, you didn't sort of have that problem of inputting 20 megabytes because you weren't even thinking about it. You were just doing it. And that's a kind of subconscious learning process, which is a lot more powerful because you're playing it in. So, this is a much more powerful way of learning something than listening to me as you do right now. The other thing you learn probably is that a simple question has many different possible answers because you see the diversity of outcomes. I gave you a pretty simple task. The other thing you'll hopefully also maybe reflect on is what is creativity really? Creativity has been defined as rearranging well-known objects into hereto unforeseen combinations, which is the duck. I did this exercise with the Google executive leadership team, and Larry Page shared an interesting reflection on inventing PageRank, the algorithm that governs the Google search engine, which consisted of two ideas. One is the idea of making a search engine, which some of us will remember was called Alta Vista and Likers and other things way before we had Google. And the other one was how we've always indexed scientific journals 
back before the internet, we had big books that sort of would point us to, on a given subject, which one would be the article most people had referenced. And so it was like the leading entry on a subject. Larry Page did a simple thing. He said, why don't we use that principle in an internet search engine, two well-known objects, and combined it and created an innovation, which was the page rank algorithm that to this day governs the Google search engine. So you learned that also. The other thing is that you were intrinsically motivated. And so when we play, three things happen. We're having fun. You talked a lot. I could see you were engaged in a different way. You're also learning, and you're seeking an objective. And what we have found is that this is a far more effective way to bring children to realize that human potential, that actually the worst thing we can do is to subject them to the system we've used now for such a long time, bringing them through listening exercises opposed to really constructing new knowledge. Only when we really construct something do we truly grasp the subject we're dealing with. And that's why we're all about lifelong learning and learning for all children and for children of all ages to realize their full potential. And I do mean it when I say of all ages, because a famous person once said is, you never grow too old for playing. You grow old because you stop playing. Mm. So thank you for the time. OK. Well, Jurgen, you've set a new bar on how to get attention of going in this group. That was very impressive. Um, thank you for starting there. And um, we have a lot of ground to cover and some time to do that. But first, I thought I would just share. So I've known Jurgen and I now. For, we've known each other for several years on the Starbucks board. Um, and when I asked him to do this, and we talked about the fact that it's black tie, I did get a chuckle out of the following thing. He was wondering if he should bring his white tie or his black tie. And I was like, hmm, I don't think most of us in the US have both of those things. So uh, tell us why. But more importantly, I want you to talk about what this, what's on your, your tuxedo. Yeah, so this is my giraffe. And that, that comes from that uh, the Danish monarchy. We are a constitutional monarchy, of course, very tiny country the size of Massachusetts and five, five, six million people. But the royal family claims to be the oldest or one of the oldest. It, it's the only to conquer Britain or England, as it were. So the only royal family the English queen needs to bow to is actually really? the Danish royal family. That we is a fun a, fact to we, know we, and tell. Next to trying to beat England in soccer, that's the best fact. But uh, so of course <laughs> we have these uh, old things where you have to wear a white tie and go to the castle and uh, the queen will, gi will give you, it's not really a knighthood, but it's like an order. And uh, I I'm one of 5,000 people who received a, a special order by the queen, but there's of course a ranking system at the top of the ranking is the, the order of the elephant, which is really only given to the likes of US presidents and so on. So I decided to bring my giraffe order instead of the elephant order, and it landed well with the queen. Oh, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Such a fun, fun thing to know. So we started with, we're going to go into the, you know, a lot about what you did at LEGO to really bring it back from the brink and the exciting future. But let's start with this power of play idea. In fact, actually, as I was getting ready for this and read a lot and heard a lot of your interviews, I feel like there's many leadership principles that I kind of organize the interview around that I think most people in business could benefit from, frankly. So let's start with this power of play idea. And I guess really important to me is how do you infuse that into the innovation of the company? How does that play out in a way that, whether you think about who you're hiring or how you drive innovation? Yeah. So I. And we are a family-held company. I'm not a member of the family, but it is an entrepreneurial family. And I think for me, sort of the reflection is there are those companies that make, make bread and they eat the bread themselves, and the whole culture is all about making bread. In our case, it's, of course, not bread. It's, it's, it's play. And I think it's so important that the culture reflects the product. So I think part of our issue when we came into a crisis is we had lost track on what we were all about. In fact, we were trying to be what we were not to appeal to a wider audience. Um, and so it's very fundamental, I think, for the leadership of the company to be really understanding what is play and also infusing that into the culture. And that starts with insisting on we have a unique reason for being. And that unique reason for being is we make this material like nobody else. Um, I then thought the whole qualification there, like many people would think, is 
molding plastic at extreme precision. And the, it is, we are a very high quality plastic molder, but that's today a commodity skill. Anybody can do that. And so for a long while, I thought this, we're, we're finished. You know, somebody in Asia is going to make a much better version of us. Uh, and then really working with kids, doing ethnographic studies of how they play, how they learn, how they develop, we figured out that there, it was all about the design, it was about how appealing the sets were and how children play, but it was also making it as accessible. How do you make something that's sufficiently challenging so it's not boring, but not so challenging that you give up in advance? And we realized quite a few of those competitors, some of them coming out of China or Far East Asia, made things that just weren't fun to play with or too difficult to use. And that then came come down to the building instruction, the whole design, and basically stimulating the creative urge that is within every human being. It, it, it is a universal thing. Everybody loves to create. And some will like when they learn to play the piano, they will play what somebody else has written of music and they'll just enjoy recreating that. But others will break away from that and really make new music or at least their own music. And we have to be a platform uh, for that. And so as you think about who you bring in as designers or executives, even I noticed on your website, I opened it up and it's pictures of kids as the executives. It's very cute. But um, how, does that, how do you find the right talent to lead that spirit of play and innovation? Tell me a little bit about that process. So uh, for the designers, a lot of the designers we have are so-called adult fans of Lego, so they're really passionate about Lego. It's also some that just at a certain age rediscover Lego and they want to do it. It's not based on a particular education. It's a craft-based application. They spend several days with us, uh, and we try to discover talent. Some of them I've actually met at fan conventions. Some of our best designers are people I've met when I traveled the world. Of course, it's not like I meet them and you're hired, but right. you know, they we go We have had into a few people tonight that I think are adult fans that could be future designers for you. I'm not sure. Absolutely. There's a lot and, of passion. Uh, so, so, so we, again, it's, it's, you've got to love what you're making to do that. In, in terms of the executives, um, I think our founding family is very grounded, very wholesome, very humble, uh, and really embraces this notion that there can be so many different answers to any one question. Uh, which I must say some people find a little bit uh, embracing complexity. They're looking for that black and white answer, what do mm -hmm. we do next? And sometimes that has to be like that. But we are a culture that really embraces diversity of opinion and creativity of expression. And you know that's why I always say thank you for all the things you did that I never asked you to do. Because if people just do what they were told to do, where, what, what's new? Then that's you right. might do it yourself. Uh, so I'm looking for people to surprise me, to come up with creative solutions, things I've never thought about. Surprise me. I like that. So let's go back. We're going to start a little bit on your personal story, and then we'll come to Lego. But uh, listening and learning about you, I understand your father was an engineer and your mom was a teacher. And I think I also heard that you really couldn't have toys with batteries when you were a kid. And I'd love to hear more about that and kind of how that shaped who you were. And also, I'm sure there's many parents here that not that you're here to give advice to parents, but this intersection of the digital and you know, non-digital toys and world you know, that we live in today. So talk a little bit about first about this engineer teacher upbringing. So um, I had a, a father who was so systematic that he would actually keep a catalog of his books and CDs and DVDs. You'd say, hey dad, you know, now I'm at the Hilton Towers. Do you have the fugitive with uh, Harrison Ford? And he said, wait a minute. Section D04. <laughs> and like he just loved Ooh. systems. I mean, like he, it, was, it was just yeah. his craving to create logic and structures and systems. And my mother was relatively opposite, uh, a very creative kindergarten teacher. And, and uh, I, I feel that, and that somehow that influenced me to understand those two sides of it. I never felt at home with this notion about, oh, so are you all about the hard skills and the science? And, and so on, or are you more over on the arts and literature? I, I, I think the, the value is in both, and the, the ability to use, so to speak, your left and right hand, if that's the left and the right side of the brain, at the same time. Uh, you know, I think business innovation is a combination of discipline and creativity. And I think the Lego brick 
is endlessly logical, endlessly systematic. Everything fits together exactly, uh, but it's also endlessly creative. Yeah. So that has True. become, because of my upbringing, just something I believe very strongly in. And I, I think my parents were emphasizing that because they said, no, you can't have any passive toys. You know, you must make your own toys. Uh, use your hands and, and go do that. I still managed to sneak in a battery-driven Lego train. And <laughs> it was, it was, they weren't more uh, rigorous than that, but uh, I, I thought that was an important element right. in, in shaping and do that. You, and I know you have four children yourself. Um, how, did that affect how you thought about toys and games for your own kids? And definitely. how did you navigate that in the current time? <laughs> yeah, definitely. And of course, uh, it's been a I brought some Lego things home, and my four kids have looked at that like, ah, that's a good test. <laughs> uh, fortunately, other things they're very nostalgic about or they love doing, but they've, they've been different in, in their approach, and that, that's been a great laboratory. But also, of course, they are a generation growing up on, on digital toys, and I'm actually convinced there's nothing wrong with digital play. Digital play is fantastic and has the same characteristics. In fact, I believe coding and algorithmic work on, on digital platforms is exactly like building with Lego bricks. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, by the way, I used to be very concerned about passive entertainment. I think there's a space for passive entertainment as well, where you reflect on yourself or you just have a little bit of downtown, which is so difficult for, for kids to get these days. So I think that's completely fine. That's interesting. It's a sort of a balanced approach. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So, okay, so let's talk about your journey from classroom to boardroom. So it was interesting to learn that you, you were a kindergarten teacher for a while. I'd love to know about that. And, um, and you also, obviously, you have a PhD in economics. You've kind of done it all. Talk a little bit about your journey from classroom to boardroom. So what happened is I was born in 68. I grew up in the 70s. And I don't know about the US, but uh, Denmark was definitely the hippie territory at the time. And uh, my, my uh, main teacher in primary school had just graduated at the teaching college and was very hippie and introduced me to the Rolling Stones and uh, took good care of me. I, he even took me to an election cool and he crossed out all the names and then he wrote John Lennon and then he made a check mark. And it's like, very special guy, and um, he taught me storytelling. We wrote novels, we made movies, mm. uh, which at the time was difficult because cameras was very special, not so easy to get to and so on. But when I reached grade seven, I was unable to spell, and even my mother was starting to get a little bit concerned <laughs> with this teacher. And he insisted that, no problem, because Jan is really good at drawing, so he'll just draw for you where he's gone if he can't write a note. And my mother was like, okay, this has to stop. So, uh, but, but I do think it's interesting that I think what he saw in me was somebody who looked out of the window instead of the, at the blackboard, mm -hmm. and he stimulated that, mm -hmm. and he thought where there's interest, there's learning, and then we'll get to what he's not interested in when he gets older. Uh, and I did finally get interested, and I, I graduated at the top of my year in high school in the country. And then I felt like, okay, the world is open, what do I do? And my mother said, I think you need to teach. And so I was lucky to get an assignment in a local kindergarten. And I ended up working there for 18 months. So how old were you then? Then I must have been 18 years old. Oh, yeah, yeah. OK. The kids and must I, have loved that. <laughs> I, I learned so much from those kids. Uh, it was an extraordinary time. It was in a not so privileged area. And some of those kids were not having an easy time. And it was amazing to see them and get that little window to what it means to growing, helping somebody grow and find their full potential. Kind of like I felt, I had, I had felt I was, you know, if my sister was here, she would say my, my brother was a nerd or a loser, you know, like <laughs> she's a very loving sister, but you know, I was really a misfit in school and I ended up getting through it all. And I, I saw some kids that I felt I could help on that journey. Um, and in the meantime, I saved some money. I was able to go to Japan for, for a while. Got very fascinated with Japan. I wanted to do more on Japanese philosophy and so on. The only way I could do that is to study a, a combination of economics and Japanese or Asian culture. And so I came into college. I did that. Got frustrated with a local monopoly on selling English language books, which were the main, uh, mainly used books for studying economics in my country. And so I started a bookshop with some friends. We went bankrupt, 
lost a lot of money. That was my first bankruptcy, uh, and that was a good, Wait, it's a good lesson. Bad. I don't think I ran two. across all that in the <laughs> Lego is the other one, but uh, <laughs> it, it was it was very helpful, and I got a little bit uh, infected by the thrill of running a business. Mm. So I redirected some of my economic studies towards business management, uh, but really uh, felt so spoiled. I was really driven by my intellectual curiosity, I think is the fine way of expressing that. And so the school just edged me on, uh, and I ended up doing this PhD in business economics that took me to MIT because they had all the coursework that the Danish system couldn't offer. And I just had a thrill of it. And um, in the middle of that, McKinsey approached me and offered me a job. I managed to go to parties at McKinsey for five years before I finally yeah, How did you get them. invited to all those? Well, I sort of signed up, and then they said, why don't you come to our summer party? And I did that, and at one point, uh, a very senior partner at McKinsey said, you've got to start working at some point. You just can't party all the time. So, so I joined McKinsey when I had uh, handed in my PhD dissertation, and I thought, I'm going to do this for a little while because it's going to teach me something about strategy, and then I'm going to do, go back and do uh, an academic career and, and focus on, 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 on you know, working intensely with, with a little group of people that I can see grow. Um, and then while I was at McKinsey, a, a search firm called me and said they need somebody to, do, to head up business development at Lego, and they're going through a lot of difficulties. Would you be interested? And of course, my childhood love. So I called my wife and I said, I'm just going to do Lego for two more years, then I'm back at the faculty. And uh, that's 20 years The rest now. is history. We didn't really talk about this, so I assume you played with Legos when you were a kid, a lot, oh, right? A lot, yes. Did you have a favorite build? Or? Yeah, I played a lot with uh, trains and I built big layouts on a ping pong table with uh, all sorts of things. And you know, I think what I experienced is what many children experience. This is the one play where they have their parents' full attention. Hmm. So my mother loved it. My father, of course, was so, all over the building. Uh, and um, yeah. It's a very nice time. Do you think you'll go back into academics at some point in the in the future? Uh, I've met it? some. I, I, we we have a Lego endowed chair at, at MIT's Media Lab and at IMD, and we have an Institute of Play at Cambridge University, and then at Tsinghua in China. And when I speak to the people there, they say, "You know, you can't come back, right? I mean, you may think you'd learned a lot, but you're worthless to academia." <laughs> <laughs> so. I don't, I, think, uh, I don't think I can do that, oh, but uh, I, I enjoy my link uh, with academia, and uh, I'm probably uh, not a very typical CEO or business leader in that I'm, I'm very interested in sort of why are we doing this, and is this really valid, and what's the philosophy of driving change, and mm -hmm. so on, and I've learned the hard way with board members and other colleagues to keep that to myself because they're kind of like, can we just get from A to B? I really don't care how you get there. This is what you want on a board, diversity yeah, of thought. Absolutely. So good. But, but I mean, I'd say one thing that impressed me was, um, I, I was, when I became CEO, I was very lucky to have an extremely smart CFO who, who would later say to me, you tricked me. You didn't tell me how bad it was, but that was because I had no idea what state, how bad the state of the company was. Um, but he, he looked at me, and I had all my McKinsey slides, of course, and I was thinking, what do we call this playing to win, getting fit back to win? You know, I was really thinking about my slides, and he just looked at me and he said, you really don't know what the strategy is, do you? And I said, no, probably not. And he said, I think we'll call it an action plan. <laughs> I thought that was really boring. He said, because this company's problem is it doesn't act. It just does not do what it says it wants to do. It's full of words. It's very philosophical. So he taught me the hard way to start doing things rather than talking about them. Uh, and you know, he said, you do realize nothing happens because you write a PowerPoint slide. Well, let's go. OK, this is good. I want to dig into this. So let's step back, because we've got a lot to unpack here. So tell me if this is about right. So Lego was started in 1932 by old Kirk, Kirk, Kirk Christensen who was a carpenter, started waking, making wooden toys. I also just learned that the Lego means what in Danish? So it means play well in Danish. Well. Play, lie is play. It turns out in Latin it means I assemble. 
It means what? I assemble. Oh, interesting. Okay, so Lego, very interesting name that he chose. Uh, 1947, by then, they were then producing the interlocking plastic bricks, right? And the Christensen family still controls the company, as you said. It is the world's largest and most profitable toy company today. But there were some rough spots along the way. So let's talk about that. When you first entered, and you started as a head of strategy, and then you became the CEO at the tender age of 34, which is unbelievable. But I just want to say, as I was learning about your background, my second leadership lesson for you, the first is power of play. The second is having a point of view and the courage to share it. Okay, because you'll tell the story about the paper you wrote and how that was a catalyst for you to become the CEO. And I think what's great about that is I think a lot of times people don't know how important, and it's risky, but sometimes to take a stand and have a point of view and share it can be a huge catalyst for your business career and for the business itself. So talk so about that. So I was an academic. I, I thought we were all looking for the truth. And I was heading up business development. So I traveled the company. I got, like a, three, the truth. I got like a 360 degree view of the company. The guy who was not the family owner, but really running the company said to me, why don't you go to Germany? We have a 35% market share. Other markets should learn from that. So I packed my suitcase and go to Germany. It turns out we have a 12% market share. So I thought, this is really interesting. <laughs> so this company lacks transparency and information and things were not uh, consolidated. So I traveled all around for a year and a half and uh, met a lot of people. I walked into the owner's office and I said, I think we need to either close our theme parks or sell them off. He said, out. Mm -hmm. uh, I said, we need to stop manufacturing in Switzerland, out. <laughs> and then he said, why don't you build a chain of brand retail stores? And uh, I looked at that. I brought in somebody from Nike who had built Nike, Nike Town. And I went back to the board and I said, this would be a really dangerous move for the company at the stage it was in. And again, the owner said, out. <laughs> but, but he did say, you're the first guy who's actually telling me what you think. So I said, OK, I'm going to write a memo for the board. Uh, so in, in 2003, I wrote a, a way too long, very philosophical memo to the board. And I was called up the day before the board meeting. At that time, I was sort of sitting in the chair of CFO because there was a change. We were waiting for a new person to come in. And the chair of the board, who's an in, independent uh, non-executive director, called me and he said, I read your memo three times. Are you kidding me? I said, no, I think it's kind of interesting. <laughs> Uh, and I came to the board meeting. The owner disowned me again. He said, I, th I think Jan has misunderstood it. It may be bad, but it can't be that bad. Next year will be better. And as naive as I was, I said, no, it's going to be worse. Uh, and um, he, they, they kicked me out. Then I realized I had been terribly naive about the whole setup. I called my wife. I walked around the building. And I said, this has been so much fun. Now I'm going back to academia. <laughs> uh, and... Um, yeah, a few months later, the board called me and said, we'd like you to put together a plan for the future. Incredible. So talk a little bit about, I, mean, I, I guess this would be a good segue into my third leadership lesson from you, which is focus on the core. And I know you don't take credit for inventing this concept, no, for sure. but you did it really, really well. So talk about sort of the main things that you had to do, maybe the state of the business, and then the things that you had to do to get it back on track. Yeah. So again, I was super lucky. I was on a plane. We have our US offices uh, in, located in Connecticut. So I flew from Boston to Amsterdam on one of those night flights. And next to me was sitting a gentleman called Chris Souk, uh, who's from Bain and Company, or used to be. And he just published a book called Profit from the Core. And he, like many people, you know, when I get on a plane, I have to decide whether I say I work for a rural Danish chemicals company or I work for the Lego Group. <laughs> and if I work for the Lego Group, I have an ongoing conversation for some time. And you Chris was Lego telling me, day. and you I said, said Lego, Lego that day, we, had a, we, we talked all night. And one of the key elements of his book is that if you want to move beyond your core business, assuming you have at some point built a really strong, near enough sort of dominant business within your core, you're a real world leader in that or leader in your segment or whatever part you operate in. Then he said, maybe one time every five years you can make a big adjacency move. That's how difficult it is. And then we sort of wrote down all the things Lego had done the prior 15 years. And he said, More oh, I know. You read my book upside down. You did five moves every year. <laughs> and that taught me the, the discipline of really figuring out what's in the core mm -hmm. and not being let's say, cavalier about expanding beyond your core, that you can't really be an expert at that many things. 
And that's where uh, there was another person who was super helpful to me, a friend of the owner. I met him every quarter. He asked me two things every quarter, which was what went wrong and why do you exist? And it took me two years to figure it out. The answer to what went wrong was I said it was poor management. He said, drink up your tea, you never need to come back again. Before that, I told him it was the US dollar and bad competitors and so on. So that was about owning it. But the other part, why we exist, is what I shared in, in, the, in the intro session. And from that, you can then sort of start thinking about, OK, if we're really about that material, for instance, one of my huge mistakes was I decided we don't need to produce this. That can't be core, because everybody can make the bricks. Mm -hmm. uh, the core is in the design and so on. So I went ahead and outsourced 90% uh, of our manufacturing and logistics. And uh, in that process, moved it from places like US, uh, Denmark, Switzerland, to places like Eastern Europe, inside the European Union, to Monterey, Mexico, and so on. And it was a complete disaster. Uh, because not of the quality of the molding, but what I had completely overlooked was that we make about 100 billion Lego elements, of which 50% sell in the in-season. And so they come out in about 20,000 variations of shapes and colors. Mm. So being a little bit philosophical, we're almost sort of Stalinistic in our view. We're trying to plan what people will buy in a very complex process. Mm -hmm. If you get that right, you'll make a ton of money. If you get it wrong, you'll be in serious trouble. Mm -hmm. And by outsourcing it, we lost complete control of that. Mm. So we took it all back in and integrated it on a highly uh, adaptive IT platform that to this day is predicting demand. And so we know exactly what we'll produce and wh where all those elements are that we need on Tuesday afternoon mm -hmm. for a delivery to Amazon. So that skill became core. That's a, that you know, it's a bit core. like okay. the building instruction is, is very essential in the design process. So it was a journey of discovering what, what are the things right. that really belong in the secret source? And so through the company's whole history, when it had been the most successful, which prior to my time was 93, it had had a return on sales of about 10, 12%, which is nice and decent. But after we discovered this, it flew up to 37%, oh, really which is too. pharmaceutical margins, which we've now moved a little bit below because wow, that's, we need yeah. to invest more are, in, in finding other segments. Right. What are some of the things that you jettisoned that were not core back then? So because we were also in, we were in a, I mean. You were in a crisis. We, we had no financial management. I literally gave a talk to the finance team why cash flow and balance sheet is important. Uh, because the company was 29 separate legal entities controlled by the family. There wasn't a proper group structure. We had taken big loans with Citigroup to fund our expansion into Legoland mm -hmm. parks and movies, and there were no covenants. We, uh, well, rather, we broke all the covenants. So I literally had Citigroup on my doorstep and said, thank you, we'd like all our money right now, which we did not have. So we were technically uh, you know, running out of liquidity. Mm -hmm. So I sold everything I could possibly sell. So we had a book publisher, we had a video games team that, by the way, went on to very successful. I sold the theme parks all our office buildings, you know, just everything to generate liquidity and regain some degrees of freedom to then engage in that focus on the core. And in that process, there were some things we sold off we should not have sold off, mm -hmm. uh, just like we should not have outsourced the manufacturing. And then there are other things that was perfectly all right. It was a distraction. Uh, Did you ever think you'd go from being a kindergarten teacher to having to make those kinds of decisions? I mean, one time, I, somebody I worked for used to say, when you have no choices, you have no problems. And I guess you had no choices at that time. You had to drive liquidity and get the core, focus, yeah. get focus on the core. But those are big decisions. And I'd love to come back at the end to then when you were able to then kind of expand again, because obviously you have. But in the process of getting the business on track, this is, I promise, my last leadership lesson I pulled from you, number four, which is humility and patience. So I think already tonight you've said two or three things. Well, I think you used the word disaster once, <laughs> but two or three things that you would say you did that weren't right, which I give you credit for that because not everybody can do that. But you also had to have a lot of perseverance and patience because this was not an overnight 
mm. journey. And the owners obviously had to really believe in you throughout this process as well. So maybe just tell us a little bit about how you found that inside you to have that kind of perseverance and humility, and how did you motivate your team to stick with this? Yeah. I also made uh, mistakes in how I motivated my team. I, the first two years I said, we don't need a vision, we just need to survive. And that was not enough for people. Uh, I also gave a very bad interview to the local business media where I said, I think maybe only a third of our leaders can really do the job, which was like the worst thing <laughs> you can say. It's like, what an Note idiot. Note to self. There's like too much truth here. Uh, so I made a lot of bad things there. But no, I think my, I mean, I think we all have something from our upbringing, and I think some of that humbleness comes from that, perhaps. But um, in, in some sense, I was lucky because when I was named CEO, the business media, of course, said this is a disaster. He's like a professor. He's worked for five years, and now he's running this iconic Danish national brand. The owner must be stupid. Uh, so you know, it's like easy for me to say, I don't know how to do this. And so I already mentioned a couple of people who gave me good advice. Uh, but also, you know, like there's a famous uh, business advisor here in the U.S. called Ram Charan, who's this whole author of the Focus on Execution and so on. And I reached out to him and he said, I'll do it for free. I just like what you're doing. And so he coached me for two years. So there were so many people who were helpful. But more importantly, I said to my colleagues, I said to the whole organization, I need your help. And so we worked with the adult fans of Lego on what should be the essence of the product offering. We had made some bad calls on our preschool portfolio to change the name. Customers and consumers came back and said, just give us the old name. So we rebranded back to so, so there, there was this whole atmosphere of nothing is sacred. Everything can happen. Just tell us what you're looking for. And I've mentioned this thing about thanking people for doing things I didn't ask for. So I think I was lucky to get a start on that. That also took away the hierarchy and empowered people uh, to, to do that. So I didn't have to sort of pretend to be like, oh, I know exactly what we need to do. Mm -hmm. um, and that allows for failure and, 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 um, and that learning process. So I think that's right. very powerful. Talk about, I think I heard you use a phrase once, sunny pessimism, or was it rainy optimism? I don't know if you were like a sunny pessimist or a rainy optimist, which, but, but you kind of try to strike a balance. In, yeah, that was that. because uh, it was very interesting, this uh, CFO I, I managed to get on board. He, he had been the CFO at uh, the country's most successful bank. And they made every month the profit we were losing on an annual basis. And he said to me, I, I don't get it because I was in this bank and everybody's like pissed off every morning. They show up, they're grumpy at work. Everybody's fighting each other. It's very political all the time. And then I come into this office. This office is like a complete bunch of losers. You're losing so much money. The cash is flowing on building. <laughs> but <and> everybody's <laughs> super happy. What's going on? And so he was a little bit, you know, the bad cop in our relationship. Like he would show people a number and then he'd ask them to guess what it is. And it was the amount of shareholder value we destroyed every hour or things like that. He sounds like, like a really fun guy like to have He around. was like okay. really, uh, you know, sometimes he would say, what Jan means is you can't travel business class anymore. Okay, have a nice day, <laughs> you know. And, um, but a uh, great sparring partner for me. But, but the thing was that we were actually almost too happy, like we were too mm -hmm. unconcerned. And so I was trying to make people a little bit more sort of, let's be a little bit realistic here. Mm -hmm. Let's not lose all hope, but let's also see things as they are and that you know, perhaps we are in more trouble than we kind of really recognize. Uh, and, and that's when I introduced that notion. I said, we, we need to, to have this sort of a ra rainy optimism, I called it, to be able to do both things at the same time. And then I had a town hall meeting up in Connecticut with our US team. And of course, the US is always, I'm sorry if it's not generally the case, but we find, we Danes, we find that the Americans are always so happy, you know, and so excited. Yeah, and like that. And um, <laughs> like the other morning, I was going for a jog in Central Park. I just have to share. And I'm, of course, at Starbucks at 7 a.m. in the morning, buying a coffee to take back to my Manhattan hotel. And I'm wearing this Nike running app. I've used it for 10 years. There's nothing new about that. And there's a guy in the queue standing next to me. And he's like, oh, I work over at the Central Park. What app is that? I've never seen it. Whoa, that's so amazing. So you can track. Like, in Denmark, that would never happen. People would be like, 
I don't want to talk to you. You're a stranger. <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he didn't so, even know you were for Lego. And you know, it's uh, so. So of course, the U.S. team said to me, "Can't it be sunny pessimism?" <laughs> it's like, so like whatever's going to make you guys whatever happy. Whatever makes you guys happy, exactly. but just be sure to be a little bit skeptical about your right. own forecast. Well, now let's talk about the. I have a fun section I want to do at the end here, and our time is flying. Let's talk about current. Okay, let's talk about the exciting things that are happening now, or maybe kind of how you brought the company out. But one thing I want to talk about is the brand. Of Lego, just for a minute, and mm. and I thought it was funny. I, I read, uh, I heard you say once that everywhere you go, people feel Lego was invented in their country. So the Swiss think it's a perfect example of X, and the Germans think, and the Americans think, which is the sign of an unbelievably powerful global brand equity. So I'm just kind of curious to hear you talk more about that, and sort of how do you think about what is core to the brand, what's guardrails, and how do you manage it globally? And then we'll talk about how that feeds into the expansion strategies that you've done. Yeah. So so. I actually think that the owner family, by keeping the company private, has been able to stay very authentic and very real. They're very, very dedicated to sustainability. They're very, very dedicated to children's safety and children's rights. And that, of course, started with mechanical safety of toys and so on. They were the first to phase out PVC and all sorts of things. So I think over the decades, they've built a trusted brand. and. Today, there's something called RepTrack by the Reputation Institute that surveys 250,000 consumers across the world. And Lego is consistently the number one trusted brand in that survey. Um, and also, uh, you know, there's something called TalkWalker that surveys uh, social media chatter about brands. And they named the Lego brand the most loved brand and most trusted brand across social media. And so it's not about how much you're mentioned, but it's how mm -hmm. people talk about. And so, one of my roles today representing the owner is really to protect the brand, not in the sense of trademark, that's mm -hmm. important of course, but more that we are constantly authentic and we're not saying something, we don't put our words behind or our money behind, uh, and that we all the time live up to the promise of the brand, which is to, to uh, offer uh, you know, jo joyful building and pride of creation uh, and learning through play to children and so really be very serious about that, and uh, the family has granted a 25% ownership in the company to the Lego Foundation, mm. and just over the last 18 months, the Lego Foundation has granted $200 million to COVID, and another $400 million this year to develop children through play, uh, really reaching those children who not have access to, to Lego play experiences. So the ability to sort of live out those values <laughs> is... I think the, the making of, of a pristine brand, uh, which should never be taken for granted and, and really needs to be monitored all right. the time. Right, and how, and how do those, those, the platform of the brand then, how does that then bring you back to things like retail, like, like you know, um, movies, things that you got out of for a while, but then you successfully kind of broaden again? Talk yeah, about so, so what I took away from Chris Sook's lesson was that we can't be uh, the best in the world at all sorts of things. So when it came to the idea of making the Lego movie, you have a studio like Warner Brothers that releases 10 huge movies a year. We'd never done it. Obviously, they know how to do that. And so we entered an agreement with them where they actually had the final say on the script. So they took all the risk. They could decide what it looked like. But that was but risky for you too. Very risky for yeah. us. And so what we did with Lord and Miller, who, were, who wrote the script and directed the movie, was we took them to the fan conventions. And in fact, uh, on my first day as CEO, I joined something called the LogNet, Lego User Group Network. That was before Facebook even existed, hmm. where Lego fans would debate Lego. And they were very skeptical of me being non-family member and having taken over their company and you know being a McKinsey guy, that's gonna be terrible. Uh, so they grilled me on the, uh, the facing out of old gray, a specific Lego color. Oh. that we had decided old gray, old gray okay. a particular kind of gray that they used for, to building castles and mountain sure. landscapes mm -hmm. and so on. And they were really pissed off about that and I, I had to explain them. that. That's what I mean about baking bread and caring about what it tastes like. So one of the things I told Lord and Miller when they wrote the script for the Lego movie was that story and many other stories, mm -hmm. including about glue and which is very important to Lego fans that you don't glue things. Um, but I also told this about Old Grey, and so in the Lego movie for aficionados, 
there's a scene where Batman flies off in his Batmobile that can fly or whatever, and the hero Emmett says, do you really, you know, wouldn't it be great if this plane would be orange? And Batman turns around and say, no, I only work in black and sometimes in very old gray. Oh, that's... And of course, Missionado. you have to have been there to know it, but there were at least uh, 500,000 adult fans who knew that story really and they loved cool. the movie. But I think it's a way to ask people to be authentic to the brand, but also, right. uh, you know, also when it comes to the video games, the Lego video games have been very, very successful. But I think it's kind of like, just because you're the author of the novel, you may not be the best director mm -hmm. of the movie or the best writer of the script. That, but I that imagine you give, say, in video games, some guardrails about, you we know, do. Sort of, here's the way we think about the brand in this format. We, we, this do, we do do that in terms of violence, how graphic mm -hmm. it is, the humor, uh, you know, that there has to be Lego bricks. This is a longer story, but it's very hard in digital animation to actually make square objects. So, you know, you can't just fill it with Lego elements and so on. So you know, there's a lot there. Uh, I'd also say sometimes it's not become, I mean, that also happens with our own product development. Sometimes we do things that, frankly, we shouldn't have done. And there has to be a time and a place for that as well. Right. Uh, and just uh, recognize that, that very openly. But I do have a 74-year-old owner who nearly builds everything himself. And he's not uh, shy of calling me on the strangest hours of the day and say, have you built set 75256? What's that? <laughs> like, I love that. He, the that, owner that, does that. But I mean, that's what cool, I mean actually. is about really, you know, that you got to eat the bread you bake yourself and right. that infuses the culture. Incredible. Okay, a few more topics before I get to our little fun section at the end. Okay, one thing we haven't talked about, obviously this is plastic, right? Plastic made from oil, <laughs> challenging uh, uh, material to operate Absolutely. in today. So talk to us a bit about how you guys think about sustainability and the yeah. materials in the future for LEGO. Yeah, so top down, we think we have two jobs in the space of sustainable business. One is this mission of letting every child fulfill its fullest potential. That's where our foundation efforts lies and all our social engagement work through the companies. Then there's climate and sustainable business in that regard. And it's basically sort of three things. We want to have a supply chain where there's no waste. Uh, and that means we need circular products. We need circular design of products. And we need to be entirely based on renewable energy. And we've signed up for the uh, science-based targets. So uh, the family uh, have invested more than a billion euro in offshore wind. So we produce mm as much energy as our whole system uh, consumes of energy. So that's the first step. And then the step of designing circularly designed products and a circular business model will be another 2 billion euro uh, behind that over mm. the next 10 years. And that's a scary challenge. Uh, the first we do is we phase out all single-use plastics. So many of you will know when you open a Lego box, there are small plastic bags. It's actually recycled plastic. And of course, if you dispose of it, responsibly, it's actually from a CO2 perspective, a pretty smart way of doing things. We're facing those out and replacing them with paper bags because mm. paper is of course easier to dispose right. of. And then by 2025, we will be completely out of all single use plastics. Mm. Then we're left with durable plastics. And there are many people who say, you know, I have the Lego from my childhood and I gave it to my grandchildren. And that, that's true, but we also, I'm no longer as naive as I was 20 years ago, so I know that, of course, when we make 100 billion elements a year, some of these end up in the wrong place. And um, so we are investing massively in producing bricks that uh, are not biodegradable, but can be collected and uh, are made of a sustainable source. What that translates into is that instead of using virgin plastics, it has to be recycled plastic, or biofeedstock-based uh, plastic. So that could be from sugar cane, not the part you can eat, but the other parts that you're not eating. Uh, it could be uh, from PET. So we are now making, on trial basis, Lego bricks made from PET, so bottles, mm -hmm. recycled uh, plastic bottles. Mm -hmm. But it's definitely a, a journey where we need the full plastics industry to come along, because although we are famous plastics manufacturer, because we make very small parts, 
in volumes we are much smaller than, for instance, the car industry. And we use the same types of plastic. So we hope that over the next 10 years that will happen and that will reduce 80% of the CO2 in the fullest scope of the business. Because 80% of CO2 in sort of so-called scope three, so our full value chain, is the raw material manufacturing of plastic mm. racing because it's oil based. Right. Uh, so that has to change. And then there's the circular model. And I think we all know what the circular model will look like is that you buy the Lego Ferrari set, you have it on your shelf, you play with it for as long as you want, and then one fine day you go back to the Lego shop and you say, I no longer need this, mm -hmm. I'd like my money back. Uh, so I know how to do it theoretically, how to make it sustainably also financially is a bit more of a challenge, but we have to experiment with that. And the replay initiative yeah, that everybody got doing. invited mm -hmm. to here uh, is one of the things we're trialing um, and are finding, you know, some people are quite keen on having a place where they can return their That's legal great. elements when they Well, there's a lot used. in there that I think we can all learn from the, the leadership stances that you're taking. Um, all right, where do you see just the future? I mean, what are you excited about as you think 10 years out for LEGO? So our vision for the future is that we really want to be a, what we call a force for learning through play. We actually want to change how the world thinks about learning. I, I have this personal feeling that my learning was screwed up, but somebody did something good to me mm -hmm. by chance, maybe, or by goodwill, and, and it changed my life. And I think we can change the lives of so many kids. And of course, many of you this evening has shared how it has changed your lives. And we really, that's the owners, you know, the, I now mostly work with the fourth generation owner who is 10 years younger than me. And he's saying to me, I just want to make sure we reach all children in the world. So that's through the foundation, mm -hmm. it's through the legal group, it's through some of our other activities. And I think what it's going to lead to is that we'll always have the, let's call it quote unquote, the traditional toy business, which will always be the mothership in our fleet. But then we'll have a significant business in education and education technology. We'll have a significant business in digital play, uh, which is where most children mm -hmm. spend their time now. We are also, like all other brands, talking about the metaverse now. We don't know exactly what that means, but we think it's going to be important. Uh, and um, we are also uh, very keen to continue to be in entertainment, in children's entertainment, location-based mm -hmm. entertainment, uh, hands-on play, uh, in partnership with others and through our own offerings. So that's kind of the trajectory we see. And the family is thinking that they will never sell this asset. So they're all in on investing long term in, in all aspects of that. That's and that, that's what my job now is to kind of oversee that uh, ten, 10 year plan for the right. brand. Well, listen, you, uh, you should feel really proud of what you did to help the company get to a point that now you, know, you can think that far out and that broadly, which is, is really exciting. All right, we have a little bit of time left. We're going to do a little lightning round. Speaking of children, there are several members whose children submitted questions. I love it. They're great. And we're not going to cover them all because some you've covered already. Uh, but we'll just, you know, mm -hmm. see what you think. All right. So I'll say the name of the member and their child. Let's see. So we have Laura Barris. And she's got a few kids who had questions. A lot of people have a few kids with questions. I'm going to pick one or two. And so my favorite is that her daughter, Mia, who's five, asked, how did you become boss? Now, you don't have to answer that because you've already answered it. But I like the fact that Mia is wondering how somebody becomes a boss. So I'm just saying, I'll pull that one out. So then um, Laura's other kid said, how do you make the colors of Legos? How do you decide what colors to choose? So maybe you can talk a little bit about that. So we have huge debates about colors. And uh, it's because it drives the complexity of the supply chain, of course. And uh, we used to just use all base colors. Then we introduced green. And then from there, it went crazy. We had more than 100 colors at one point in time. We currently have about 65. Yeah. And uh, we, the designers are really very decisive on that. They really love to use certain colors for different sets to create different moods and themes and immersive mm. branding of special parts, uh, and, and that's how we manage the color palette, and uh, it's And are there new debate. colors every year? There are new colors almost every year. Okay. Uh, and then there are some other colors that get retired. And is it uh, always a thing, like when, it, when the color goes away, somebody's mad? Yes, okay. it's always the case. You can't make everybody happy. And there are also elements that retire every year, and there are new elements that come in. Okay. And, yeah. All right, that's good to know. All right, Carl Dahlstrom's son, Leif, who's nine, asked, what is the biggest Lego ever made? 
So the biggest Lego ever made is the Colosseum. It's a bit more than 9,000 pieces, and it came out last year. Okay, that's pretty cool. Um, oh, this is hysterical. So Anne Freidick has several kids. Molly, who's six, says, can somebody please teach my parents how to build the frozen ice castle without having extra pieces? So is that, is that a thing that happens a lot? Like, yeah, it, it, I, I mean, haven't had little kids for a while. There so was actually a on. nice story in Fast Company just recently where somebody had trialed requesting pieces. So we actually do have a service free of charge. You just need to call or write us what you're missing and we'll ship it to you. Uh, oh, because okay. people, I, we believe we don't lose that much in the supply chain, and I, having surveyed it carefully, I think that's probably true. But it's very easy to lose elements Christmas Eve or whatever. And uh, so we do, uh, and people use the building instructions and they say, I need element this or that, and then we'll, we'll ship that. We do sometimes get, I need exactly all the parts for the metallic Darth Vader figure. And when we get more than 10,000 of those, we kind of go, wait a minute. <laughs> this <laughs> but, is not a legitimate but it, request. It really is uh, very important to do that because you cannot finish the set without the missing elements. All right, so Anne has another daughter, Ashley, who wants to know what's the most popular Lego set that's ever been sold. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, there are, uh, I think, uh, two, two, two candidates for that. Uh, one would be actually the Lego Mindstorms, which is a robotic set, but that's because it's been so stable and not changed for so many years uh, at a, and at a, at a relatively high price point. Um, last year, uh, I think it was the Nintendo Lego Nintendo starter set that was the most popular set last year. I think I saw that behind you on some Zoom calls. I'm not sure. I think I saw yeah, that in your right. office. Okay, so again, you've got a lot of good direction here coming from future Economic Club members. So Olivia Betty's daughter, Simon, who's 10, says, I think there should be more Lego friends and there should be more babies and the Lego minifigures should be more diverse. We've got a lot of requests here. Can you do all that? <laughs> no, it's actually, uh, it's such a great point. And I don't know what you guys think. I'll share with you the dilemma we have, which I think is an interesting one because of course, I think Lego is an expression of diversity because there are so many answers to every question, but I also need to be honest and say we're a Danish company. And uh, one of the things that happened during my time was we were 1,000 Danish men at the top of the company and I then actually uh, splintered the headquarter and moved headquarter functions to central London, to Connecticut, US, to Singapore and to Shanghai. And that has allowed us to attract a much more diverse workforce but we're still on that journey. Uh, and the next question then is, what about the product portfolio? And we just had the Gina Davis Institute survey all our products. Mm. And what they came back and said is that what we are missing is higher representation of various kinds of disabilities. Uh, so that's now a huge emphasis. And you'll see that already in our marketing and assortment. And you'll certainly see it a lot more in the coming years. The next thing is then that the Lego figure, like my figure here, of course, everybody will know it has a yellow head and yellow hands. And according to our founder, the family, that's because it's a neutral color. It's not supposed to signify any kind of race or ethnicity. That, that's a dangerous statement. Interesting, yeah. And so how do you relate to that? So of course, we've asked, not knowing what the answer is. And actually, many people came back to us and said, it's, it's about much more than the hands and the face. It's about the hair. It's about the equipment they have, how they're dressed, what, you know, would they have some extra things they could use. Uh, and we've taken the step within Lego Friends, which has a different figure in, it's a long story, but there we have much more diversity. And in Duplo, our preschool range, we have more diversity in certain IPs like Star Wars, we represent the diversity they have there. Mm -hmm. But we're sticking with the yellow heads uh, for some of our general themes, but we'll be offering opportunities to modify that to basically offer more diversity because it is a key concern. Uh, and it's important that the child feels represented in the Lego set. Uh, but of course, some of our designers then say, so what color should the policeman be and what color should the thief be? We have all this Lego police and right. you know, there's just a lot of uh, tricky questions. But what we know is that children more than anybody really care about this question. And so we need to sort of really listen carefully and 
find a way. I really appreciate you sharing that. I think that's a challenge for so many businesses. And Simone asked a really good question there. She asked a great question. And you shared some very good insights. And I'm sure it's because it's important to her, and we know it's important to a lot of kids. That's great. Who is the most famous master Lego builder? That's from Perry McEntee. Fiona's son. So uh, there's the TV show Lego Masters, of course, which some of you may have seen or heard of. And uh, in Australia, there's literally a guy they call Brick, Brick Man. <laughs> and I, I met uh, uh, Sean many years ago, and he's an extraordinary builder, and he's made a profession out of <laughs> building with Lego bricks. And he is really I- I- incredible, Ryan Sibury is the name. And he, he is the judge on, on Lego Masters Australia, which was the place in the world where the show really had a breakthrough. And then, of course, it came here to the U.S. last year in the middle of the pandemic, and it was the number one unscripted show on American television last year. Wow. And, and that's where you find a lot of the real masters right. uh, of building. Uh, there, there's a lot of them, a lot. Uh, well, you do have a fun job. Sometimes Let's face it, and you've met some pretty interesting people on the way. Okay, last question. I saved this for last. This is from Wyatt Shoemaker, Michelle's child, who's eight. Okay, what is the coolest thing Lego is going to make? Ooh, that's a very if you can well, tell us very well kept secret. I figured it's a well kept uh, secret, but try us out. It's so funny though with secrecy because Denmark is. Um, according to surveys, the most trusting and non-hierarchical culture in the world. Um, until it's not. Apparently, <laughs> until it's not, and apparently uh, that's supposed to where it's ra- uh, people think they're the happiest people on the planet or whatever, but so we're, we're a bit naive. And we hired a former FBI officer to do cybersecurity and general security for the company. And at that time, my office was next door to the factory because I like to be close to the factory. And he literally walked into my office, then he walked into the factory, he took a box out, then he walked into my office, and on my shelves he found binders of the fast li- five last year's board meetings, and he said, you're fired. It's like, <laughs> you are not in control of your security. So like everybody else, we've invested heavily in yeah. that, and now our product development team, even I can hardly go there without signing in and so on. It's so uh, well guarded. Because the likes so are you of, not going to answer Wyatt's question? Is that what you're telling me? That's you're what I'm telling you. Wyatt it's completely impossible. No, what's coming next? It's a well-kept secret. No, I'm teasing you. Okay, that's fine. We tried. We tried. Um, listen, I just want to say thank you again, Jurgen. This has been an honor. It's been a pleasure. So much fun. And I just want to thank everybody who's joined us this evening here and also on their screens. And everybody have a happy holiday. And thank you so much. Thank you.